Good evening and welcome to Public Observatory Night from the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. My name is Sarah Hogan and I'm the Donor Relations and Events Manager at the CFA. We are pleased to present tonight's lecture in a virtual format, live streaming to both Facebook and YouTube. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, simply type it into the comments. We will answer as many questions as time will allow at the end of the talk. If you're interested in receiving our e-newsletter and information about upcoming events, please make sure to sign up for our mailing list by clicking on the link in the comments. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Nadia Whitehead, the CFA's new public affairs officer, who will also be taking over as host of Observatory Nights. Nadia joins us from the University of Arizona, where she served as Director of Communications for the College of Medicine. There she worked closely with the senior leadership team to build the college's reputation amongst local, state, and national media. In addition to her work in public relations, Nadia has served as a journalist for NPR's Science and Health Desk in Washington, D.C., as well as for the News Desk of Science Magazine. Her work has also appeared in Discover Magazine, Everyday Health, and Undark, a publication of MIT's Night Science Journalism Program. Nadia holds an undergraduate degree in multimedia journalism from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's degree in science and medical writing from the Johns Hopkins University. Nadia truly enjoys working with researchers and sharing their stories with a broader audience. She's pleased to join our team and to present Observatory Night to you. And now I'm happy to hand it over to Nadia who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I just wanna say thank you for hosting Observatory Night these past few years. While we're sad to see you go, I'm also excited to start hosting these wonderful evenings. Now, let me get started and present tonight's extraordinary speaker, Dr. Clara Sousa Silva. Clara Sousa Silva is a quantum astrochemist here at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. She investigates how molecules interact with light so that they can be detected on faraway worlds. Clara spends most of her time studying molecules that life can produce so that one day she can detect an alien biosphere. Her favorite molecular biosignature is phosphine, a terrifying gas associated with mostly unpleasant life. When she is not deciphering exoplanet atmospheres, Clara works hard to persuade the next generation of scientists to become an active part of the astronomical community. Clara holds a degree, a doctoral degree in quantum chemistry from the University College London and a master's degree in physics and astronomy from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Among her many achievements, Clara is a recipient of the prestigious 51B Pegasi Fellowship from the Heising Simons Foundation. The fellowship support, supports the growing field of planetary astronomy and exceptional postdoctoral scientists who make unique contributions to the field of astronomy. Clara's work and commentary has been featured in the BBC, National Geographic, Wired, Scientific American, and the New York Times, among others. Prior to joining the Center for Astrophysics, Clara served as a research scientist at MIT. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Clara Sousa Silva. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us tonight, Clara. I'll let you take it away. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Nadia, and thank you all for being here this evening. So as Nadia told you, my goal is indeed to one day identify life beyond Earth. And today, I wanna to tell you how I'm trying to get there by studying all potential signs of life, even the really weird ones, and by training the next generation to join the cause. So how does the search for alien life happen? Well, to answer that, let's try and reverse this problem. Could an alien civilization know that we have an inhabited planet? Imagine an alien astronomer on the other side of the galaxy also looking for life in their night sky. If that alien astronomer pointed their powerful telescopes at our sun, they would be able to split our sun's light into its spectrum. And this is exactly what they would see they would see that some of our light, the light from the sun, would have been absorbed by atoms and even molecules in the cooler regions of the sun where they can survive and leave behind these tiny little shadows, which we call absorption lines. 
And that happens because molecules behave in a really unique way. Molecules have to follow the laws of physics like everyone else, but it's not quite the same physics as we are used to. Molecules are so small that their physics follow the rules of the quantum world. And one of those very strict rules is that they have to absorb quantized amounts of energy. And these correspond to specific wavelengths of the light spectrum, and so different colors of the rainbow effectively. Different stars have different atoms and different molecules within them, and consequently they have a different spectrum. And this one is our suns. So they could look at this exactly the spectrum and using their universal knowledge of molecules that they got from their quantum astrochemists and know exactly which molecules and atoms were causing these absorption lines and use that to figure out the composition of our sun. But if they were patient and also if they were fortuitously aligned, they would be able to notice that every 12 years, new additional absorption lines would appear and then disappear and then 12 years later appear again and then disappear again. And these lines would be due to the molecules in the atmosphere of Jupiter as it crosses in front of the sun. An alien civilization with only slightly better technology than we have now would be able to study these lines and know that Jupiter has a huge atmosphere with not just hydrogen and helium, but also methane, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and many more complex gases. And if they were really, really careful, every year, a few much fainter shadows would appear and then disappear, and then a year later appear. And of course, these would be due to the molecules in our own Earth's atmosphere, also absorbing new lines of the sun spectrum. And that alien civilization could study these new absorptions, tiny, weak absorption lines, and learn that we are a thriving, complex, living planet. These alien astrophysicists could do this for all of the solar system planets and tell the difference between them by looking at the atmospheric spectrum of each planet, an example of what you see here on the screen. If they did that, they would learn that Venus is mostly hell with very high levels of sulfuric acid. So any life in there will struggle, though more about that later. And they would learn that Mars has a teensy tiny atmosphere that can barely shield its surface from radiation. So also not the most hospitable destination. And they would know that out of the solar system planets, there's something really, really special about the Earth. And that is we have a lot of life. You can think of our atmosphere and its subsequent spectrum as a planet-sized message communicating to the galaxy that we have oceans and forests and varied ecosystems with rich life cycles and also that we pollute an awful lot. And those alien astronomers would be able to know that on Earth, we don't just have an atmosphere, we have a biosphere and we can do the same to them. Now, first we have to actually find the planets themselves, and we've been working really hard at that for a long time. We found Uranus in 1781, Neptune in 1846, Pluto in 1930, and then lost it again in 2006. And then we found our first exoplanet in the mid-90s, and we kept finding more and more. With the Kepler mission, we found thousands of planets, and with a more recent test mission adding to the count, we have now detected over 4,000 planets. With upcoming missions, we will find tens of thousands more. So we're really getting good at finding the planets. We have just begun finding atmospheres on these planets, and we still know very, very little about them. Future missions will provide more data on more planets and their atmospheres, which means we are now on the cusp of being technologically able to detect signs of life. But when thinking about detecting life, how do we know what to look for? Well, we can start by looking for signs of life as we know it. The easiest biosignatures or markers for life that we can detect on exoplanets are beloved gases that we already know from our own life on modern Earth, like the ones you see here on the screen. And these exist in our atmosphere in reasonably large quantities. So I'm talking about molecules of life we find pleasant loves, such as methane and carbon dioxide, which are produced in large abundance by life. But even other molecules like hydrogen cyanide, which aren't particularly popular by signatures now, but this molecule was likely crucial as a building block of life. So you could consider it a good pre-biosignature. So we know of these gases and we can and we should look for them on exoplanet atmospheres. And the way we look for them is by looking for their own spectral signature. Each molecule has a spectrum of its own, which looks roughly like these, describing how each molecule interacts with light and where their absorption lines will fall on a, a spectrum of a star. 
If we want to detect any of these molecules in an alien atmosphere, then we need to measure or calculate the spectra for each one of them. So these are molecular fingerprints. This is very much possible to get the fingerprint for every molecule that we care about, but it's really difficult and requires a lot of lab work, often in very dangerous conditions, or a lot of computational work, which is the bit that I do, but that requires very large computers and many years of simulations. But even if we could detect any of these molecules on their own, they wouldn't necessarily indicate life. And that's because they all have false positives, by which I mean non-biological sources that can also emit, emit these molecules into an atmosphere. So things like volcanism and photochemistry. So here on the screen, you see a, a column of molecules that are happily produced by life, but you can also see other ways of making these molecules that do not need any biological intervention. And this is true for most of the atmospheric gases that life loves. They're also produced by non-biological sources. And this isn't a cruel astrobiological coincidence. This happens, this false positive problem happens because the chemical potential energy gradients that life likes to exploit are also easily exploited by geochemical processes. What this means is these molecules are great. I love them, but thermodynamically speaking, they're quite easy to make. And so the detection of these molecules in isolation in an atmosphere wouldn't necessarily indicate life. Now, there are solutions to this false positive pr problem. One is to just carefully consider context. For example, oxygen on its own may not be a particularly good biosignature, but in the context of our planet, our sun, and the other components of our atmosphere, oxygen is a wonderful and robust biosignature. But sadly, context is not always easy to determine. Specifically, knowing which molecules form the chemical and atmospheric context for a given biosignature is particularly challenging. My old group at MIT tried to be really agnostic about this problem and came up with a list of all the possible atmospheric gases that could form the context of a potential biosphere. But that list contains 16,367 molecules. So the first problem is that this is a long list, but it is finite and that's an important difference. The second problem is that we currently only have the tools to detect a tiny fraction of these gases. And what this means is our ability to understand the chemical and atmospheric context of any biosignature we might want to detect is not great. And that makes it very difficult to resolve the false positive scenarios for these popular biosignatures of life as we know it. But life as we know it is likely only one island in the vast archipelago of possibilities for life. Our galaxy has a huge diversity of stars and orbiting them are planets of every kind. Earth alone has given rise to billions of different species. So it's not a big leap to think that life itself can arise in a large array of unexpected forms and that life would have many strange biosignatures beyond those that we are used to considering. Which brings me to the other solution to the false positive problem. And that is, we can look for the molecules that, although are maybe less popular and certainly less pleasant, are biosignatures with very low or no false positives, and so they need less context to signify life. So an extreme example here would be CFCs or any other signs of industrial activity. But as you can imagine, that's an, an edge case. My favorite of these strange molecules with low false positives for life is phosphine. This is the phosphine molecule. And when I first met phosphine over a decade ago, it was very much considered a terrible biosignature. In fact, phosphine was only known for two things. One, it was known as a, a very good marker for violent storms on Jupiter and Saturn. So phosphine is detected in the upper layers of these planets, but it's a little surprising because the temperature and hydrogen pressure there are far too low for the formation of phosphine to be favored. But what happens is phosphine, after being happily formed in the hellish depths of these planets where it is thermodynamically favored, is then aggressively dragged to the top by strong currents, surviving to much larger concentrations than we would have predicted. So phosphine ends up being quite important for understanding the chemistry and dynamics of gas giants, but it is much harder to sell it as a biosignature. And that's because the only other thing phosphine is known for is for being a horrific molecule. 
Phosphine is a highly flammable and extremely toxic and outrageously foul smelling gas. It interacts with oxygen metabolism fatally. And so it's a really effective killer. And this is why it's widely used as a fumigant or as pesticides. And sadly, for the same reason, why it was also used as a chemical warfare, warfare agent in the First World War, and most recently by ISIS. Now, both war and pesticides are unequivocal signs of life, but I wouldn't necessarily expect or hope alien life to be fond of any either activity. So at this point, phosphine still did not seem like a promising biological molecule, just a rather scary one. Phosphine is indeed awful and most life avoids it and I don't blame it. But as I was researching phosphine, I realized that for about a hundred or so years, there had been quiet but regular mentions of phosphine being found everywhere which is very much unexpected. You see, on rocky planets, so not gas giants, so terrestrial planets like the Earth, phosphine is so hard to make, and it is so toxic to life, and it is so reactive with the radicals in the atmosphere that we shouldn't see it anywhere, and yet we do. We find it in trace amounts ubiquitously throughout the globe, and in weird places in strangely large quantities. Places such as sewage, marshlands, rice fields, lake sediments, the intestinal tract of fish, the intestinal tract of babies, the feces of penguins, the farts of badges, and actually the intestines and excrements of most animals, including ourselves. And the one thing that all of these ecosystems have in common is that they're all anoxic. They're without oxygen. These are biological niches that are populated by anaerobic life that is not reliant on oxygen. On Earth, these environments exist, though they are poorly studied. And here, phosphine is not so evil. It is only phosphine's relationship with oxygen metabolism that makes it so toxic. But for the majority of time that life existed on Earth, it didn't rely on oxygen. And so other planets with life less oxygen loving than our modern Earth could happily have phosphine as a popular biosignature. So with that in mind, Myself and my team ran innumerable simulations of future observations of potentially habitable planets, all so we could figure out whether phosphine could A, survive in a variety of hypothetical planets with oxygen-poor atmospheres, B, whether it could be detectable in the near future, and C, whether phosphine would be distinguishable from other atmospheric components. Could we actually tell it apart from the rest of the atmosphere? Now, I spent my entire PhD using quantum chemistry and very fancy supercomputers to calculate all of the spectroscopic properties of phosphine so we could find it anywhere in the galaxy. And I found that it had quite a distinctive and rather beautiful, if I say so myself, spectrum or molecular fingerprint, which you can see here in black. And that sets it apart from other molecules seen here in color. So we found that with a telescope like the James Webb Space Telescope, we could detect phosphine on oxygen-poor planets orbiting a cool small star. Um, and there we could detect phosphine if created by life by at least these production rate values. Now, these are completely reasonable production rates comparable to the global rates of methane on Earth and well below the maximum local phosphine production rates found on Earth above places like sewage plants or penguin colonies. Now, on planets orbiting sun-like stars, we would find it harder, but still possible, to detect phosphine on only a few scenarios, namely the puffy atmospheres of hydrogen-rich planets, and only if they really like producing phosphine. So to detect phosphine on a planet orbiting a sun-like star, we would need something like a full sewage planet or an intestine planet, whichever you only prefer, which I know doesn't sound particularly appealing, but I can assure you we would be disgusting to them too. Still, the takeaway here is that on potentially habitable planets, phosphine can be both detectable and distinguished from the rest of the atmosphere. And this made phosphine really quite promising as a biosignature. But what makes phosphine really special is that it seems to have no significant false positives as long as it's found on rocky, temperate planets. So definitely not a sign of life on Jupiter. We came to this conclusion by considering every false positive scenario we could conceive of. To figure this out, we looked at just standard chemical processes, so phosphate reduction and phosphate disproportionation. And here, unlike the production of methane or hydrogen sulfide, we found that in all cases, the formation of phosphine was highly thermodynamically disfavored. 
So then we try to think, what if we consider much more extreme situations? So we looked at lightning, volcanism, and meteors, and we found that even in highly reducing atmospheres, which really should be the most favorable for phosphine production, only a negligible fraction of phosphorus could turn into phosphine, and always many, many orders of magnitude below anything we could detect. So at that point, we looked into increasingly more implausible scenarios, and none delivered any substantial false positives to phosphine. So at that point, we found that given our current understanding of rocky planets and their atmospheres, we now had a tweetable conclusion that read, any detectable amounts of phosphine on a rocky planet cannot be explained without life. Now, this paper was published in January last year, but it spent a long time in revision. And during that time, I told anyone who would listen about this tweetable conclusion. And I told many board audiences that phosphine was a great biosignature, effectively without pos uh, false positives. And when I submitted this paper in 2018, I thought this was a cool conclusion and I stand by it, but it wasn't controversial at all. It was just me describing a totally theoretical, hypothetical situation. I was imagining a, a distant planet, an anoxic tropical paradise with a rich biosphere producing tremendous amounts of phosphine that we might one day be able to observe, hopefully within my lifetime. You may now know that phosphine turned out to be a little more exciting than I had initially envisaged. A few months after I submitted this paper, an astronomer at Cardiff, Jane Greaves, reached out to me asking for help with interpreting a JCMT observation seen here in white, and later up a follow-up with ALMA shown here in orange, that seemed to indicate that phosphine might just be present in the clouds of Venus, the only potential, potentially habitable location on the planet. Now, Jane knew this was strange, but needed a, a phosphine expert to know how strange, and that's how our collaboration began. Now, the notion that phosphine, a molecule high at, claimed to be a promising biosignature might be present on Venus is, of course, very exciting. And the press thought so too. But before we jump on life as an explanation, I should point out that there is still much about Venus we do not understand. And so all we really know is that something strange is happening. Now, currently, there is plenty of controversy surrounding this potential discovery, and I'm happy to discuss this here to some extent. But ultimately, what we need to do now is address the primary uncertainties of this discovery. Namely, is the signal definitely real? If it is, is it unambiguously phosphine? And if it is, what is making it? Now, to try and answer these questions, I am trying to get more data by looking at Venus in the infrared, uh, given that the original observations were in the radio. And I'm doing this later this year. And as we learn more about Venus, perhaps we can get more and better models that can help us make sense of exactly what's going on there. But to make the most of both models and observations, we need better spectroscopic data that can not just describe phosphine, but every other atmospheric component of Venus and how they interact with one another. This spectroscopic toolkit is vital for us to understand what is happening on Venus, and I'm working on it very hard, but what I want to highlight at this point is how a virtually unknown and quite unusual and revolting molecule became such an important piece of the puzzle in the search for life beyond Earth. And phosphine is just one molecule. Venus is one planet. Even if it turns out that indeed we have found phosphine on Venus, this will not be the last time we'll find a potential biosignature on a planet beyond ours. So the question is, will we be better prepared to interpret such a discovery next time? Well, that's what I spend most of my time working towards. Remember those thousands of molecules that could form the context of a biosphere? We only have spectra for less than 4% of them. The remaining molecules, the remaining 96% of them, are currently completely undetectable. Now, I do spend most of my time working really hard to solve this problem, getting the spectra for these mis missing molecules. And I would love to repeat the work that I did for phosphine for all of these thousands of molecules. But I'm just one person. And to investigate phosphine, a single molecule, it took a lot of sweat and tears and computer effort and four years of my life. Which means if I was going to tackle those remaining thousands of molecules at the same rate, I calculated it would take me over 60,000 years, which is too long. And I came to this realization a few years ago when I was writing my PhD. At the time, I was also the head of education for the Twinkle space mission, which is planned as a teeny tiny UK satellite for the characterization of planets. 
I delivered all of the education and outreach programs for the mission. But I was doing this while I was, while I was also training as a high school teacher in a North London school. That was a terrible decision because it turns out teaching is way harder than astrophysics. But while I was trying to teach as best as I could, I noticed that whenever my research was mentioned in my classroom, the students and I would get into super interesting discussions. And that made me think, what if I wasn't working on these thousands of molecules alone? So I created a new program called ORBITS, or Original Research by Young Twinkle Students. It took me a long time to come up with that acronym. And I recruited 15 of my own kids to research molecules with me and three junior scientists who agreed to help. And this is the first cohort of students, the pilot program, which were split into three groups, each dedicated to studying the spectra of a molecule crucial for the detection of, well, for understanding exoplanets and their host stars in general. This is team titanium oxide, and this is team acetylene, and this is team methane. Now, these amazing kids learn astrophysics, quantum chemistry, programming, scientific writing, and together performed original research on these three molecules. They went from being my high school students to being my scientific collaborators and co-authors on multiple papers with their high school as an official scientific institution. These students you see here then became mentors for next year students, and then those the year after, and so on. I hired someone to replace me when I left the UK to, to move to the US. So the program continues without me. And since 2018, more than 100 school kids have been published authors of scientific papers through the Orbitz program. And we also found that students who participate in Orbitz are more like likely to take advanced STEM classes when given the choice. So although we're still working on small number statistics, it's certainly encouraging. And to continue the sort of work in the US, I became the director for the Harvard MIT Science Research Mentoring Program. In it, myself and a small admin team recruit three to eight junior scientists, mostly postdocs and senior PhD students, and we help them adapt their current astrophysics projects to benefit from student collaborations. I then hire, train, and pay a salary to 10 to 15 local high school students, assign them to mentors with whom they perform original research throughout the academic year. And at the end of the program, we organize a scientific symposium for the students to present their research to the scientific community and their friends and families. And I hope you all attended this year. We actually have just settled on the date. Um, so mark your calendars. And also the applications for next year's cohort will open in a couple of weeks. So if you know any high schoolers in the greater Boston area who would be interested in joining the program, do send them our way. I also run another program called Jura or Junior Research Award, which is aimed at high school and undergraduate students that have extraordinary potential, but for some reason don't quite fit into these other programs. For example, Emmeline is working on cataloging planetary disks, and I'm currently supervising Asma and Kara to further improve my phosphine spectrum, and we're almost ready to submit that paper. And Megan and I are working on a full investigation of the detectability of potential pre-biosignature gases, such as hydrogen cyanide, which I mentioned earlier. So it isn't just me anymore. By training and supporting students, we're able to work on obtaining the molecular fingerprint for several new molecules putting a tiny, tiny dent on that list of thousands of potential biosignatures that still need spectra. Ultimately, I believe it won't be the next generation of telescopes that will revolutionize astrophysics, but the next generation of people. In the coming years, I want to do all that I can to give them the tools and aspiration to do exactly that. When it comes to characterizing biosignatures, I certainly calculate that if everyone I've trained joins the effort, and the kids may very legitimately have other career plans, but if they didn't, we could get all the spectra we need in about two decades. And that's really encouraging. Because whether you're looking for life by searching for these unusual biosignatures like phosphine, but many of the weird molecules we're only just beginning to understand, such as isoprene you see here, whether we're looking for these unusual biosignatures, which would only be present in atmospheres in tiny quantities, but have no significant false positives, or whether you're looking for the popular, abundant, potential biosignature gases such as oxygen or methane, but need to consider less abundant molecules to resolve their false positives for life. The fact remains, either way, we must be willing to consider more molecules, whether they are abundant or not. As much as I like phosphine, and I love it, 
and the more traditional biosignatures, such as oxygen and methane, which I also love, I don't think the detection of life will come from a single molecule. As the Venus story shows, the detection of life will likely be quite uncertain. And that uncertainty will only be reduced if we're willing and able to both detect and understand more molecules, even if they're not abundant or pleasant. Because just because a molecule isn't abundant does not mean it's not significant. It may be much harder to detect a trace gas that has a very small impact on its atmosphere, but if we want to reduce our chances of false positives and consequently increase our chances of actually confirming life with the sort of certainty that we all want, then we have to be willing to consider the big picture, not just a few promising molecules, but all the possible molecules that can together help us reduce the ambiguity in the detection of life. But today, we are not prepared to both detect and confirm the presence of most biosignatures on an alien planet. So my biggest professional concern is not that we will fail to detect a habitable planet in our lifetime. My biggest professional concern is that we will point to our telescopes directly at an inhabited planet and just not have the tools to know it. But there are billions of stars in our galaxy alone and billions of planets orbiting them. And these planets could contain trillions of life forms, releasing thousands of molecules into their atmospheres, just waiting to be detected. So by using state-of-the-art computational chemistry and collaborating with students of all ages, I aim to provide the tools to understand alien biospheres so that one day we'll know life when we see it. Thank you. Thank you, Clara, for that wonderful presentation. It was so interesting. Um, audience members, it's now time for the Q&A portion of our lecture. If you have a question for Clara, please just type it into the comments on Facebook or YouTube, and we're going to get as many uh, get to as many questions as possible tonight. So uh, let's get started. The first question we're going to spotlight um, is from the Oopla. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so they want to know, are there any chemical compounds that, if detected, we can say would definitely rule out life as we know it? Oh, yes, the anti-biosignatures. So the concept of kind of what is a good biosignature or a bad biosignature depends a lot on the kind of life forms you consider. So biochemistries that are compatible with ours need things like water as a solvent. They need reasonable temperatures and pressures that are somewhat similar to the ones we find on Earth. So even if you just consider the extremophiles on Earth as the you know, range of biochemistry that we can handle, not all the molecules can survive those temperatures and all the molecules are volatile at those temperatures. So if we saw those molecules that have very high boiling points, for example, then we would know that biochemistries like ours would have a terrible time. And so that doesn't actually tell you there's no life, it just tells you there's no life we would want to be hugging. But plenty of different biochemistries like silicon-based life and many other forms um, that don't rely on things like thiols that we do would have completely different biosignatures. So that's part of the reason I look for any molecule that could be produced and then try to figure out in the context of the atmosphere, does it mean something weird is happening, that there's something producing it rather than looking for a specific molecule because then we'll just be biased to the life that we find pleasant. pleasant. Okay, thank you. And we'll now go to the next question. Um, Chuck wants to know, what are the next steps to confirm possible biosignatures on Venus? Excellent question. So there are many things you can do. Uh, one of the things uh, myself and other team members have started doing is trying to look at other phosphorus bearing molecules. So other molecules that would be involved in a network that phosphine is part of to try and figure out exactly how it's being produced and destroyed. And that'll give us some inkling towards whether or not it's being produced by life. So that's to contextualize phosphine. And that's true for any other biosignatures you find. But then really we're looking for anything that is in disequilibrium. So anything that is there only if it's being constantly replenished. So that's a really good sign. We're also looking for things that change with the seasons and with the day and night. So day night variations, uh, latitudinal variations and seasonal variations, all of which are things that at least life on earth very much reacts to. And so if there's life on Venus, we would expect it to do so as well. 
But people have also started looking for things like the sort of molecules that are produced when photosynthesis happens, because any respectable Venusian is going to be making use of the sun, because that's where the energy is coming from, um, most of it. And so looking for signs of something like photosynthesis is definitely a good idea. And looking for things like the nitrogen cycle is a good idea. And these are the sort of molecules that people have started looking for. Okay, thank you. Next question from Louisa. How do you know which regions of space, which regions of space to look for for life? Excellent question. Um, so there are people trying to find planets all over the galaxy. Uh, my restriction ends up being less where it would be good for life, though people do look at the habitable zone in a galactic scale rather than just a habitable zone around a, a star. But my focus tends to be on what can be done. So I looked at the neighborhood. I'm always trying to find planets near to us so that we can actually get good data. Some people think I wanna look for planets near to us so I can make it there. That's not really <laughs> on the cards. But if we wanna get data about these tiny, tiny molecules on the thinnest possible sliver on a tiny planet far, far away, then looking closer is slightly easier than looking further away. So my, my decisions on where to look are mostly extremely pragmatic rather than inspirational. Interesting. Okay, next question from Ellen on Facebook. Are there chemicals in the universe that don't occur on Earth that we don't know that they exist? Yes, so part of the game of trying to not be biased is very much thinking of, well, maybe life makes different molecules in other places. So there we're relying on the fact that the universe is a big and complicated place and I don't claim to try to understand it all, but we do have some things that we know are true. And that is the laws of physics are the same and the laws of chemistry are the same. And no matter how different alien life might be, it still has to make use of the same periodic table that we have available to us. We know of all the elements in the universe and there's a finite number of combinations those elements can make to make molecules. And so when I consider life, I am considering very little beyond you have to obey the laws of physics, you have to obey the laws of chemistry, you have to use the periodic table, and most importantly, life will have to metabolize. So I don't claim to try and understand what the aliens would look like, or even or feel like, or even smell like, but whatever they do, they must take stuff from their environment, go about their days, if they have days, <laughs> And, and then release some of that. It's not going to be a 100% efficient system. And so that releasing some of that is metabolites. Um, in, on Earth, they look like respiration and farting and aliens will do the same thing. They are not going to just perfectly consume their environment. And so that's what we look for. And that's how we avoid too much bias. But I'm a human on Earth. And so I will not pretend not to be biased. Okay, let's see, John on YouTube. What's the deal with methane on Mars? Huh. Well, you should ask a, a Mars expert, which I am not. Uh, methane is a wonderful biosignature in that it's produced by life in large quantities. But as you saw on one of my slides, it, it, is also got, it also has false positives for life. And so there are many ways of making methane that do not need the intervention of life. So when we, confirm unambiguously that there's methane on Mars, the next step is to figure out how is it being made. And that resolving false positives for methane is a difficult process, uh, to some extent much more difficult than with phosphine because it's so much easier to make methane than phosphine. But this is work we've been doing for a long time with oxygen. Very impressive teams here on Earth have been trying to categorize exactly every false positive scenario for oxygen and figuring out how to resolve it. So if you see oxygen, what are the next molecules you look for to ensure it is a biological production? And methane is still ongoing the same process. So on Mars or anywhere else, we need to understand where it's coming from and what else could be making it. And if I go any deeper into an answer on this, I will get into trouble for my Mars colleagues, so I will not. Okay, we'll definitely stop there then. Next question, Facebook uh, from Jack. Deep ocean research is sometimes seen as a template for looking for life beyond Earth. 
Does that resonate in any way in relation to your own research? Yes, absolutely. I think just thinking beyond kind of surface dwelling life is a really useful exercise. I think one of the reasons I like the, the Venus story so much, despite all its controversy, is that I'm hoping it will really change people's minds on what it means to be habitable. You know, Venus on the surface is unequivocally not habitable. I will go out and say and bet all of my savings, which admittedly are not very large, that we will never find life on the surface of Venus because complexity gets destroyed there. But the clouds are potentially habitable. And the same applies to thinking of things like subterranean oceans on icy moons in the solar system could also have life. And thinking of not so much a planet as habitable, but a planet as having habitable pockets might be a really good way of thinking of life. We are just privileged and blinded by our privilege because we're so lucky to have habitable oceans and surface and clouds. And so we forget that other planets are not quite habitable all the way through. And, and looking for life in oceans is an excellent idea. The only problem is how do you know it's there? Because you still need to look for gases that are released to spectroscopically detect them. So it becomes much harder to do. And there I have colleagues who work on this sort of interaction between the, the surface and oceans and atmosphere. So we can try and figure out um, biosignatures by proxy, for example, or in places like the moon, uh, Enceladus, we could try and look for the actual bursts of the geysers that come out and try to uh, figure out what's coming out of those and figure out what's going on underneath based on what we see getting spurted out. So figuring out these proxies is also a really interesting aspect of astrobiology. Okay. The next question from YouTube, Jim, are there any opportunities for citizen scientists to get involved with detecting or categorizing biosignatures? Yes, in principle, um, people have done similar things with like Zooniverse, and they've also done it with, I think, genetic code. And it's a lovely idea. And, and citizen scientists in general are great contributors to astronomy and other fields. But the problem with this is creating that interface. And I barely have time to do my normal research. I, I don't think I have the resources to you know, create a website like Zooniverse that could do this. And also I do my best to make my, you know, quantum chemistry research seem exciting by pointing out that these are biosignatures and that's why I'm looking for them. But ultimately it is quite difficult quantum physics that gets quite boring quite quickly. And so people I worry will become bored, but people have asked me this before. So I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe I should create a platform where people can try and do um, molecular signatures for all the possible biosignatures that could be useful in characterizing exoplanets. I just don't have the coding chops uh, to do it, but if anyone in this audience wants to help, I would love to have a collaborator. All right. Um, the next question, what's your gut feeling about how rare or how prevalent life is in the universe? Excellent question. Um, Gut feelings are bad for astronomy, but <laughs> I'll do I'll do my best. I basically think that any hypothesis that begins and ends with we are special is doomed to fail. You know, the molecular cloud that formed the solar system wasn't really that special. The sun, I love it, but it's also not quite that special. And Earth has many special things about it, but it's not like our the molecules and elements that form it are particularly special. And so to then think that life itself only originated here and nowhere else in the universe, we're in a special corner that the universe um, somehow sprinkled with fairy dust, that, that feels to me like a doomed idea. But my most exciting thought about this is the thought that we are not special that there's nothing special about us, that we are so mediocre, so easy to come by, that actually the universe is just riddled with life. Whether that life is intelligent or not, those are different odds, much different odds. But life itself, I believe, is absolutely inevitable given the right circumstances. And I don't think our circumstances are so special that it wouldn't happen elsewhere. And so Venus is exciting, of course, because it's next door, but I very much predict that life is common 
and we are not special, but that means we're also not alone. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question from uh, YouTube. <laughs> In the movie, Clara, I'm not familiar yeah. with the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, scientists found evidence of an advanced civilization by looking for technology orbiting an exoplanet. Are we going to look for technology outside the planet as well? So <laughs> I won't comment on the movie, but the idea that we can look for signs of life um, that are intelligent is some, probably older than the idea that we can look for signs of life that they didn't mean to send. The loudest, and it's loud, the loudest signals that life on Earth has sent out to space are very much made by technology. And so it is completely reasonable to expect the same. And we have had incredible people like Jill Tarter and many others actively looking and dedicating their careers to finding signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. And that is a search that continues and will continue. And of course, I would love to find life that I could actually chat with rather than most of the life that I look for, which, you know, is alien grass is the sort of thing that I look for. But the reason I don't focus on technology as much as I focus on kind of the, the signs of life that it didn't mean to send out to space is just a question of numbers. On Earth, there's only been one technologically advanced species and barely so. Uh, but life has been very common on Earth for many, many, many orders of magnitude longer. And so I just don't want to miss it. That's my kind of main drive. But we are definitely looking for technology outside, uh, uh, outside the planet. Oh, you don't mean outside our planet. You mean outside the planet. Yes, things like the Dyson sphere or just big structures that are signs of um, civilizations much more advanced than ours. Absolutely, we look for those. How cool would that be? No one is, no one is not checking for those. We, we're, every time we find something weird um, around a star or around a planet, we 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 definitely do our our job and we check if it's some super advanced uh, technological civilization. But um, my focus is mainly the farts. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, next question. Apart from atmospheric gases, what signatures might we see from alien plant life on the planet's surface? So on Earth, there are many signs of life, uh, and one of them is exactly this. So it's called the red edge uh, because of the way chlorophyll works. And so if we can get to the point where we can directly image a planet, there are other signs that we can look for beyond just the pure molecules that they're producing. One of those, of course, things like nightlife, you know, so we can look for the electricity, signs of electricity. Um, but we can also look for signs of something akin to what we have as plants. Uh, the only reason I don't focus on that is because it's slightly further in the future. You know, actually seeing a planet is much harder than seeing the impact the molecules in its atmosphere have on a star spectrum. Um, and so I'm hoping we'll be able to do something like this in my lifetime, but it, it's slightly longer. And the other reason that this is not my focus is I worry about, you know, being too focused on something that looks like the life we have on Earth. And I would love to find alien forests, but I kind of presume that in my mind, they don't really exist. And it's more something like, you know, a fungi network or something. All right. Um, next question from Andrew on Facebook. Could a simple diversity of signatures show a better chance of life? Importantly, providing energy gradients and building blocks. Yeah, so one of the things that we look for are these kind of pre-biosignatures, so molecules that we think are quite important for building life. Uh, a lot of these are delivered exogenously, so they get they get thrown in by meteors or comets. And so a lot of people study the spectrum of comets uh, around other stars to try and figure out if they, they could be delivering these important building blocks of life. And then, yes, we looked at, we look a lot at how molecules are interacting with the atmosphere and how those energy gradients apply for lots of things. We need to understand the full network, the whole biosphere. So we need to know the reaction rate, the rates. We need to know if they're disequilibrium species. We need to know all of these things, if nothing else, because we need to know if there are false positives for life of any biosignatures we find. So yes, 
you should look for a diversity of signatures to uh, get a better chance of detecting life. You, I always recommend that people don't focus on a single molecule, which is why the phosphine, I'll, that, uh, phosphine story on Venus is very interesting to me because I love phosphine and it's my molecule, but I specifically need to see more molecules, a bigger network, a bigger context of all these things to, to be convinced. Okay, um, next question from Jeff on Facebook. Have you leveraged machine learning for any of your work? Absolutely, so with um, molecular spectra, with the, these uh, fingerprints, a lot of this is incredibly intensive uh, computational work. There are several phases of them, some that just need very powerful computers because we're diagonalizing enormous matrices and that's a process that to the largest extent can't be interrupted or parallelized. But then there's a, a section that we can use, just throw GPUs at it, so we do that. The problem with using machine learning for the work that I do is that all of our training set is riddled with mistakes and, and uncertainties. A lot of this data was collected decades ago in differing instruments, some of which we no longer know the uncertainties for. And so when I use machine learning at this stage that I'm at, at right now, I end up propagating a lot of mistakes in my categorization. And so I'm actually I'm currently working on just improving that data set enough just so I can use machine learning because the way I'm doing it now is by hand and, uh, it's really hard. <laughs> I can imagine. Okay, let's see. The next question is from Andrew on Facebook. Could a simple... Oh, we have this oh, one. We did do that one. Uh, let me Good get question, one. though. Yes. Let me pull up another one. Okay, Stephen on Facebook. How do you define life? Can non-biological systems be defined as life? So astrobiologists and origins of life people disagree on a lot of things, uh, including the definition of life. And so I try not to step on anyone's toes by saying all I care is that they metabolize. That's that's my, my, my level. I don't try to understand any further or define any further. They have to produce molecules out of some activity. But if you're considering non-biological systems, say, um, alien civilization that's evolved beyond biology. I would probably define that as life. Um, no, I would definitely define that as life. You can have me on the record saying that. Uh, and there I would expect their signatures to be even clearer. Now, at the point where you're, you've completely circumvented biology, um, I don't claim to understand your methods or your intentions, but I can certainly believe you can now hide your own presence. So at that point, I don't have a way of finding them. I basically can only find either biological life that metabolizes or life that is not actively and successfully hiding themselves. Uh, if they don't want to be found, maybe it's not my job to find them. Okay. Uh, let's see. So another question is coming in from Facebook uh, from Unraveling the Cosmos. How much harder is it to detect biosignatures on exomoons compared to exoplanets? Is it even possible with our technology today? So not quite, but we're not far. Um, it's a similar process, except you're using the star, instead of using the star as your kind of baseline, you're using the planet as your baseline. So you can see how it gets much more complicated. And in general, you just get less photons to work with. And so it is much harder much, much like orders magnitude harder, but definitely possible. And we're not that far from being able to. Lots of people are looking at exomoons and then the next step is to try and look at their atmospheres. You know, we still don't even understand Titan's atmosphere very well. And that's an extremely important and complex moon with a, a thick, rich atmosphere filled with hydrocarbons and fantastic methane oceans. And that's a moon just here and we don't fully understand it. So we do have a little while to go, but much harder and not possible, but probably in our lifetimes. Okay, let's see. The next question is also on Facebook. Which are the detection means utilized to get the star spectrums and how is technological advancement going to offer new insights? So there are lots of ways to do it. The one I described here uses spectroscopy, where basically 
we're taking a very fancy prism effectively and, and, and breaking light into its component parts. So all the colors of the rainbow and all the invisible colors beyond it in the ultraviolet and the infrared. And so, as you can imagine, you can do this roughly very easily, but doing this really well, so splitting the sunlight into all of the colors so that we can distinguish one molecule from another is really hard. And we're getting much better, but mostly this involves getting more photons, which means getting bigger and bigger lenses. And we're getting to the point where the mirrors on these telescopes, you know, the next generation, they're gonna be, you know, the size of stadia. And so we need to collect a lot of light and then we need to be really precise. So no vibrations, no movement. And then we can break this light and try to see the different signs of the different molecules. So the bigger the mirror, the better the grating and the better understanding and the underlying understanding of how the molecules behave. These are all new advancements that are happening right now and they'll all offer new insights. We're getting to the point where we're looking at atmospheres of smaller and smaller planets, cooler and cooler planets, around bigger and bigger stars, to get to a point where we could do something like characterize an Earth analog around a sun-like star. We're not quite there, but every advancement on these facets is a small step towards that. And this is without including all the other detection mechanisms. You know, people are doing radial velocity, so looking for planets that make their star wobble. And we're getting to the point where we can detect really quite small planets around stars using this method. We're getting much better directly imaging the planets, which we have to do by covering the starlight so it doesn't blind us, and then just seeing the light from the planet. Really difficult to do. And we're getting much better at that too. There's many other detection methods, which I won't cover, but yes, we, we are getting closer and closer to being able to understand a living biosphere. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Let's see, Mario on YouTube. I get that each element has its own absorption signature, but I'm curious, how do we know that helium, for example, reacts or produces the same signature on another planet as it does on Earth? Excellent question. It is really nice to feel this universal constancy in my work, you know, no matter how different things might be, the quantum behavior of molecules seems to stay stable uh, across distances. And we have tested this by predicting uh, specific spectral signatures on distant stars, and then checking that they have the same signature that they do on our star, and they have the same signature that they do in our planet in a lab that is hot or high pressure and uh, or not, or in the wild, and, and there's this consistency in the quantum behavior of molecules that is really delightful to see, and not really that surprising. We find that the universe that we observe seems to be keen to follow the same laws of physics and chemistry no matter where it's at. And so it is really quite extraordinary to think that, you know, a molecule that we have here behaves exactly the same way in my living room as it does on the other side of the galaxy and beyond. And it's really comforting and inspiring to me to think that this tiny, invisible, literally quantum behavior may be the answer to answering these giant questions of philosophers and poets from millennia ago. <laughs> okay, let's get to our last question of the evening. John on YouTube. What ramifications, good or bad, would you be looking out for? Should we discover alien life? Hmm. So my main concern is on what we will do because we as a species do not have a great track record of finding new places or new people and then acting ethically. And so I worry about that a lot. Uh, I don't know if you mean we should worry about them. People often worry about them. I don't really worry about them. Um, one of the things that some uh, scientists still say is that we should maybe stop advertising our location and with all the TV and radio signals we have sent out, we should maybe stop advertising our entertainment choices to the galaxy and just quietly, you know, just hope they don't notice us. But of course, if you've seen my talk, they know we're here. Our atmosphere is filled with signs that we're here and we're very active. And so my main ramification, which is good, which would be 
to learn that the paradigm of life has shifted, that we are not alone, that we are not special, that we have buddies out there. And it will be really frustrating that it's likely they'll be too far for us to ever get there. But maybe that's for the best. That usually makes me feel better. I don't really trust us to go there and do right by them. So the next step, I suppose, would be to communicate with them and hope they're not awful. Um, but the most likely situation is that we would discover alien life and it would be the equivalent of, you know, alien grass or maybe alien cats. But that's kind of the only hope we have. And with those, we'll just observe them from far away. And entire fields of research will be just understanding this whole other planet. And I can't wait for that time where we have people whose entire specialties are just understanding alien civilizations that we conceive and not talk to. And that's an interesting note to end on. So thank you, Clara, for joining us this evening. This concludes Observatory Night. Thank you again to everyone who joined us. If you enjoyed this evening's presentation, I want to encourage you to support the Center for Astrophysics and consider giving at the link appearing on your screens now. Any amount will help support the research and engineering that happens here at the Center for Astrophysics every day and the effort to answer humanity's greatest unresolved questions about the nature of the universe. We look forward to seeing you again on May 20th for our next observatory night on the cosmic origin of gold featuring Professor Ido Berger. Visit our website, cfa.harvard.edu for more information. Thank you and good night.